Welcome to Disciple Dojo. You are in for a treat today. I got to sit down with a friend of mine from my old seminary days. You may have heard of him, Dr. Esau McCauley. Esau and I were at Gordon Conwell together back in the day, and since then he has gone on to do amazing things. Got his PhD under N.T. Wright, which in and of itself is just And he's also written a couple of amazing books, two of which I have here with me. The first, Reading While Black. This is one of the best books that I've ever read. I cannot speak highly enough about Reading While Black. If you have not read this book, you need to read it. And then his new book, which we talk about in this episode, How Far to the Promised Land, One Black Family's Story of Hope and Survival in the American South. And this is a memoir. Esau talks about his childhood and growing up and some trauma that happened in his family and how God used all of that to shape and and to transform him into the person who he is today, the husband, the father, the writer, the scholar. I ordered this book on Kindle and I read it in under 24 hours. It is incredibly compelling. It's available on Audible as well. So I reached out to Esau and asked if he'd be willing to come on and chat for a little bit here in the dojo and he graciously agreed to. And so before we jump into that interview, if you haven't already, do us a favor and click that little subscribe button and the notification icon right beside it. Those two things that don't cost anything are two of the most important things you can do to help us continue to grow this channel. And as always, Disciple Dojo is a 501c3 nonprofit. Everything we do is donor funded. So if you believe in what we're doing, if you enjoy the content, if you want to help us keep the lights on, then I'd invite you to consider becoming a monthly Disciple Dojo donor. That really, really helps us in a tangible way. And it can be whatever dollar amount you feel led or are able to give. Okay, let's talk to my friend, Dr. Esau McCauley. Esau, it, it, it really is great to have you here. Uh, it was, tw- we, it was 20 years between when we were in a room together and then we were in a room oh. together again. And so now it's been almost one year that we're talking again, but it's because you've been doing some amazing work. And so I'm thrilled to have you here and I want to talk about what's going on. Um, but also just want to know how you're doing. Like, what are you up to? What are you, what are you working on right now? In, oh, in thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Am I am I like um, what is it called when you enter the dojo? What are you first called? You well, you first you just just a white belt. But if you come in with experience from other academies, no, I'm a white. Training, well, I'm a white belt to the dojo. I'm you, but you are a theological <laughs> black belt, par excellence. So. Uh, so, so what am I working on now? One of the things that when you release a book, you go through like two. Um, kind of the separate feelings. One is, why do we even do this? <laughs> why do we put ourselves through like the the stress and the anxiety of writing something and giving it to the world? And you think, I'm never doing this again. Um, <laughs> I'm never writing another word. And at the same time, you want to go on to your next project because mm-hmm. there is a big gap between when you finish something and when the world hears about it. And so by the time the world hears about it, you're kind of in them ready for your second, your next thing. Right. And so I'm in the early stages of working on a project. I don't know if I want to give the title out yet. I'm just got to hold on okay. to it. You can keep it. I can, say, I, I, can, I can say it's looking at the Bible and slavery. Okay. Will it be more, um, uh, academic audience or more popular audience or both? That's a great question. That's a great question. <laughs> or just for a, a Bible nerd uh, audience. So uh, there, there, diff- there, there is um, a technical version in my mind and a popular version in my mind. Okay. And they're also in the midst of fighting for one another. What do you think I should do? Should I do the technical version or the or the, or the popular version? Man, both? I, I can't imagine doing either because writing a book is such a daunting task, but you seem to do it well. I like when people have something for popular audiences, but then they have like, if you want to know more, here's my yeah, you know, dissertation nerd version. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Th- so, that's always know. helpful. We'll 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 see what the Lord does. I have no idea whether or not it's going to be technical. Well, um, you're so you for those who I mean, dojo viewers who are living under a rock, uh, they may not know who you are. If they've been watching this channel, they've heard me talk about you, and and even when I've had other friends like uh, in our kind of scholar world on here, and they 
but if they don't know you, so you studied under somebody who's pretty well known. Yeah. When your PhD, a fellow named Tom yeah. Wright. Exactly. Well, you got you're skipping stuff. We went to Gordon and Conwell together. I studied with you. Uh, let's let's. I was gonna. I'm I'm building up to that. Obviously. Okay. You're uh, building up. That was the climax. <laughs> yeah, I, did, I did my PhD at the University of St Andrews. Mm -hmm. um, I studied under the direction of N.T. Wright, and I wrote a dissertation on Galatians. Mm -hmm. After that, I wrote a couple of other things. Um, the dissertation published is called "Sharing in the Sons Inheritance." I wrote um, Reading While Black, um, mm -hmm. African-American Biblical Interpretation as an Exercise in Hope. Then I wrote a small book, a children's book, Josie Johnson and the Holy Spirit. And I wrote a Lent book that was also kind of brief. Mm -hmm. And because I can't stick in one genre, I wrote Half Part of the Promised Land. So, yeah, yeah. E.T. Wright was at the beginning, but there's been a few things since then. And there's things before that when we were hanging out at Gordon Conwell together. Yeah, you well, you the I was getting I when I was reading. There's so many things I want to talk about, and I want to honor your time, so I'm I'm trying uh, not to like scatter shot this. But uh, so w the reason I mentioned N.T. Wright first of all is because I think he, as good as anyone, maybe Christopher Wright as well. I put them in the same category. Is able to write to both audiences in the mm -hmm. same works, and and can you know even their popular level stuff has scholarly depth that I'm just like drops, you know, jaw dropping. And so knowing your lineage pedigree academic wise, I feel mm -hmm. like you are, and this is not just blowing smoke. I feel like your works that I've, and I've read two of your books now, Reading While Black and How Far the Promised Land. And I feel like even though both of those are popular level, the, the depth that they are, that they have is something that anybody like any, actually more scholars should be able to do oh. and communicate that way because well, you're, I, I you're not it's not fluff uh you're oh. hitting things that are deep and you're presenting them in a way that is that is very profound and also engaging and that's rare man that's that's not a lot of people can do that you do it well oh well thank you it's funny because you know one of, i've been me and my family are reading john mm -hmm. um john's gospel and i was just finishing a, a round of it uh last night and there's this passage at the end where Jesus tells um, Peter that he's going to die. He's going to be martyred. And Peter goes, well, what about that guy? He looks over at John and goes, what about that guy? And, and Jesus, in effect, says, that's none of your business. You follow me. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that relates to what you were just talking about is that sometimes we can look enviously at other writers. And so sometimes I'm like, man, I wish I, I sounded as technical and nerdy as other people. <laughs> um, you know, and I, and I wrote these 800 page books with like a thousand footnotes, right. but that's actually not my skill set. Mm -hmm. And I have to be comfortable writing the kinds of books that God gave me and say, that's just my lane. Right. And if God has a different lane for somebody else, like let them run down that lane. Yeah. And I would be a very bad version of someone else. And I think that somebody else would be a very bad version of me. And so mm -hmm. if people find what I do useful, then like praise God for it. Mm -hmm. Well, so this is a perfect segue because in the book, one of the passages I pulled out. And folks, uh, just if you don't know, so Esau's book is How Far to the Promised Land. Uh, his previous book is Reading While Black. I recommend both of, there we go. I recommend both of these. <laughs> this one is one that's out now that he's doing, you know, wanting people to read and, and I want to highlight, but you need to read this one. And maybe one day I'll be able to get him back here to talk about that. Because uh, for 2021, this was in the like top three books that I read that year. Oh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I made it to the list. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. And everybody on my social media knows because I posted, I was like, y'all need to read this. Um, I was talking with one of my friends. He was like, this was like br reading life, like breathing life into me. Oh. And um, yeah, it was just, yeah, we've, you're very well regarded here at the dojo. But oh, you're thank you. Thank you. <laughs> reading um, How Far to the Promised Land in it. I knew you, you say, before there was a dojo. So I'm like pre dojo. You, all right, let's let's talk about this. This is I got to share at least one Esau from seminary story. Oh, uh, yeah, because that's what I'm here for. I'm trying. I'm not letting you. I, I know you have a plan. <laughs> but I'm not gonna let you. Execute you're the hijacking. Plan. You're hijacking and I'm, saying I'm hijacking your show. Go ahead, <laughs> give me some seminary love. My, or, hey, I don't know what you're about to say. No, no, no. It's it's nothing but love. My my, I have a couple of distinct memories from. So Esau came to you came to Gordon Conwell. You were 
the first time we met, you were coming up for a weekend just to visit and see if you oh, were yeah, interested. You were there in for studying. the recruitment weekend, yeah. Yeah, and so it was a weekend at Gordon Conwell. Nothing happens. Everybody leaves or goes off or does. I mean, it's like a ghost town in the dorms. And you were staying on the the floor, the the Fippin Hall floor, or maybe the floor above yeah. me. But I remember that weekend we were hanging out because I was like, "Oh, this, you know, hey, nice to meet you. You're also from the South. Oh, Alabama. I'm from Georgia. You know, we had yeah. that going on." And so I remember us just hanging out and, and chatting and me being like, like, man, I hope this guy comes here. Like, I think you have a great time and I think, huh. you know, we could benefit. But then you did come and we got to hang out huh. a little bit the next year, your first year, my second year. And one of my favorite memories was going to, I think it was Danvers, that one of the little towns around uh, yeah. Hamilton and going and seeing the movie Barbershop together in the theater. Oh, <laughs> that to this day was one of my favorite memories because I remember both of us were like laughing and loving it. And yeah, but it was in a part of the country that's very white. Um, and there was a lot of uncomfortable laugh because barbershop is, you know, yeah. there's some, yeah. there's some stuff that yeah. uh, some people are. Ambers wasn't ready for the barbershop. <laughs> But I just remember laughing so hard and you laughing and then us talking about like, there's not a lot of people that are really laughing at some of this stuff because they don't know if they can or not. Yeah, can um, we laugh at this? Yeah. Like people that lower their voice when they say the word yeah. black. Like when they yeah. use the word black, they lower their voice. And so those are the kind of conversations I remember us having and and just the incidents. Um, it was cool. But then I transferred down to Charlotte the next year and, and you yeah. uh, finished on and, and you – sailed into academia. And so I've just been watching you and uh, some of the other folks like Nijay and others kind of becoming the people whose books seminary students now are starting uh -huh. to read and, and grapple that's, that's, with. That's, that's very kind of you, especially I know Nijay is a really quality scholar. Mm -hmm. As is Carmen Imes, who you yes. mentioned. So they're both really good people. I want to be like them one day. And <laughs> I, I, that, I do too. That's not, fake, that's not fake humility. That's They're really talented and they yeah. deserve all the acclaim that they get. Absolutely. Well, I, I put you in that category unquestionably. And I, th this is, this is what you said in the book that touches on okay. what you just talked about your calling and not wanting to compare yourself beautifully. It was on page, um, 148 and 150. So okay. in there you talked okay. about your first sermon and oh. you said, I'm going to read quote. You said much to my surprise, I was not good at writing black sermons. Yeah, we talked about that. But then you went on to say, and I love this quote, you said, I came to understand that I had a calling of a different sort to try and put into words and on paper, the varied experiences of God in the souls of black folks. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. I, that's hmm. I, the reason I love that is because you have you. It's very rare when somebody will will be everybody wants to be everything. Like they, I, I wrote a book. I want to be the best writer. I preach a sermon. I'm going to be the best preacher. I, you know, everything they do, they want to be the best. And it takes yeah. a very, you know, uh, self-awareness to be like, yeah. this is what I'm called to do. And this is what I know yeah. I'm good at. Yeah. Um, so in, interestingly enough, it's so funny when people ask you stuff, there's like, here's, here's a secret insight. And don't laugh at me, um, because I always like to share like my bad ideas. <laughs> but the original title for Reading While Black was The New Testament and the Souls of Black Folks. Mm -hmm. That was the original title. Um, but anyone who knows is W. E. B. Du Bois wrote The Souls of Black Folks. And you can't you can't come for W. E. B. Du Bois unless you shoot and you can't evoke that that book right. unless you know you got a classic. And I said, I want I don't want any of that smoke. So <laughs> But the idea of talking about the souls of black folks has always been a part of my own kind of literary life. Mm -hmm. And so when I got to like that section of the book, when I said the varied experiences of the souls of black folks, I was actually thinking of reading while black. Nobody would get that unless you knew that was the original title. Oh, but I didn't know that. Yeah, nobody knows. That's like it's like a fun thing for me right. as a reader, as right. a writer. So like writers get writers. We as writers have all kinds of fun that like mm -hmm. no one ever gets to know about. We're right. playing literary games to keep ourselves interested. So it's really interesting <laughs> when someone pulls out a sentence where I can kind of talk about that. Yeah, but when I, I love it. About, when I talk about um, black preaching, I don't. I, mean, I don't think I'm a horrible preacher. I think I'm a decent communicator. But I come from the southern yep. black preaching tradition where you don't play, mm -hmm. and if you can't bring it, then you sit down somewhere, <laughs> uh, and. 
I grew up in an all black context and all black church. I didn't I didn't come from kind of evangelicalism and kind of meander into black spaces. And so my communication style, the way that I speak now is the way that I spoke when I was in my neighborhood, but it was just different. Mm -hmm. And even though I like to talk about God, I just wasn't from um, God didn't call me to kind of communicate in the black in at, the, at that center of kind of what was Southern black preaching at the time. Right. But beyond just like the um, the vocal inflections that I had in mind, it was really um, more that when, when I was writing sermons, there were so many ideas and um, literary flourishes that I want to do that it wasn't really fitting into a sermon. Mm -hmm. A sermon needs to be, I think, a clear proclamation, a beginning and middle and end, and you're kind of communicating a point or two. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of the times, some of the things I wanted to communicate, I realized were book-length ideas. Right. Um, and just because of my context, they didn't really have a category for writer. Mm -hmm. um, and so it took me a long time of meandering and struggling and before I found kind of the center of my vocation. Because one of the really hard things to do is how do you serve God in a unique way when everybody's used to you serving God in a particular way? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, missionary, pastor, you know, those are the kinds of things we think about. And what do you do when you have a unique calling mm -hmm. and how do you discern that? And that's what I was getting at at that point in the book. Well, it's it resonates strongly with me for a couple of reasons, one of which is I, I'm very clear, like I joke around at SBL uh, or when I'm talking to scholars, I'm like, I joke around like I'm up imposter syndrome or, you know, because yeah. I don't I, just lowly MDiv is what I say. But yeah. but I'm also it's tongue in cheek because I'm very aware that that where God calls me and the ministry of Disciple Dojo to do is to be the bridge between academia and everyday people that just love the Bible. But aren't yeah. going to go read commentaries. And, and, and so it's, it's a niche space, you know, and it's a very, and I'm okay with it. And it seems like that you're aware of that and you're not just okay with it. You're like, no, this is, I like, woe to me if I don't do this stuff. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, writing it's, the it's, book. Really, it's really interesting that you say that you have imposter syndrome. I have, I have imposter syndrome too, because <laughs> I don't consider myself a traditional academic. Right. And I see people who, and God bless them, like they have, you know, 15 commentaries, they have, you know, like Oxford University Press monographs, they have like these kind of technical, you know, leading the conversation at SBL mm -hmm. kinds of careers. And sometimes I feel like, man, I wish I had their career. I wish I had those kinds of things, because like you don't get love as a as a biblical studies PhD writing children's books. Right. <laughs> um, or writing memoirs like N.T. Wright didn't write a memoir. He just mm -hmm. did you know more and more Bible books. Yeah. And so I just or even like even like this, one of my other jobs is I'm an opinion writer for The New York Times. Mm -hmm. And most of those articles aren't directly religious. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just do a lot of different things that isn't like a standard New Testament like professor. Sometimes I'm worried they're going to kick me out of the New Testament scholar club. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so when you ask me about so it, it is it is really hard, like I said, to be comfortable in your own skin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's always someone who's telling you that you can't do something and it's something that you should do. And that, that the chapter that, that the book comes from is called call and response. I think that's what it's called. Um, and it's really me struggling with my own vocation mm -hmm. and hopefully other people who are trying to figure out what it is God has called them to do might, might feel comfortable um, breaking out of this, the stereotypical mode of um, what people think you should be. Cause I just don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, a lot of, there weren't a lot of biblical scholars who were writing the kinds of things that I feel like called to write. Mm -hmm. And so it's been really kind of tricky for me to, to na navigate these spaces. Well, it's, it, it's cr what I'm finding out running Disciple Dojo and doing interviews with biblical scholars. And those of you that are in the guild is there's a craving that people have like popular level viewers have for good, solid, rigorous academic scholarship, but in a way that they can understand and in a way that pushes past all of the the jargon, all of the stereotypes of academia and just gets super real. And I, yeah. I do, I put you in that group. I put you in that group of people who are able to do that. And man, you got to, 
just be encouraged. I, I think you're hmm. hitting a, a wider, not just wider, but a deeper need than right if you did write 50 commentaries. Um, the commentaries are coming, but thank you for that. It makes you feel good. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to the it. commentary. I'm just in case Zondervan comes looking for me. I'm working on it, Zondervan. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> All right, I'm Zondervan, me. let him off the hook. He's working on it. Back off, Zondervan. <laughs> Call down your goons. Yeah, um, no, I don't, you, I'm pulling up at SBL. Like, where's my comic? <laughs> They're gonna hire a guy who's just sitting there with a baseball bat in the corner yeah. and looking at you like, "Come on, Macaulay." Yeah, um, get it done. You in the book? You you talked about there, there's a couple of things. Again, I want to touch on because I, I mean I could just sit here and read the book and every sentence there's something that would be fun to discuss, but there was the the poignant stuff. And since we don't have a lot of time, I want to really drill in. When you you talked about a, a part of the, where you were wrestling with your identity and your calling and how you said you met, you said a phrase, you said, even my rebellion felt scripted. Oh. And you talked about in two separate pages, parts in the book, one early around page 78, I think, and then the other on page 186. You talked about experiences you had that I think are not uncommon, especially among um, black Americans, and especially in the South where you said, I'll read the quotes and then tell me if I'm interpreting right. Okay. You said they needed, this is about your experience at Swanee and in academia. You said they needed black voices to challenge their enemies on the right. I'm talking about progressive and circles. They needed their critiques dipped in chocolate. I needed less Bertrand Russell and more Frederick Douglass. And this, this was about sort of like the, the left-wing progressive uh, white yeah. academia. But then later in the book when you're talking about at a family gathering with your in-laws yeah. and you talked about so the feeling you said um the only black person in a room sometimes stop be stops being a person becoming instead black people consolidated a representative who must challenge black tropes at every turn and you're asking yeah. i wonder how this person would feel if, if they knew that's what went through my head i yeah. feel like those are the two if you had to say this is how uh for lack of a better word, right-leaning white evangelicalism versus yeah. left-leaning white evangelicalism. Yeah. It seems like those are the two uh, poles that yeah. you're talking about. Am I, am I reading that right? Yeah. Yeah. The second one was not with my family. It was just at a random holiday gathering. Oh, okay. But it was a holiday. It was gathering. It was a holiday gathering. Okay. Okay. Um, and so the first one, I'll, I'll talk about them in turn. Hmm. The first one, um, when I was... When I was in college, when I talk about the, the scripted rebellion, mm -hmm. and this is not one of the things that's really hard is to not um, shrink everybody down through your experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that everyone who, who goes through spiritual doubt is charted the path that I'm describing. What I'm saying is there's this phenomenon that leads you to believe that you kind of have one faith when you're a child or a young person. And you go to college and you read some books and then you kind of like abandon the faith. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of basically kind of secular humanism um, as the way forward to um, as the way forward in society. So you kind of say, OK, I used to be a Christian. I still want to do good in the world. Here are all of these progressive political and ideas is going to bring about utopia. Now, I, there are certain kind of political ideas that I think are important. And so I'm not saying that these things are, are kind of pushed to the right. side. What I do want to say is. I became exactly what the Academy wanted me to be when I, at a certain point in college, mm -hmm. kind of like an African-American who spoke a lot about racism and whose job it was within the system of the Academy to call both liberals and conservatives racist. So my my rebellion was was playing a particular role, mm -hmm. even within the liberal sections. Like it's your job to keep us on track racially and to critique kind of the right even more. And when I said I needed less Bertrand Russell and more Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass was, was a Christian mm -hmm. who had a particular African-American um, critique of structural racism combined with a deep faith, deep faith in God. And that the black church has a long history of pushing back against racism from the context of deeply held spiritual and Christian convictions. Right. And so what I was speaking about is this, this, this consistent desire to actually be seen and be yourself. And what I mean by that is 
just because I say racism is bad or whatever I might want to say, it doesn't mean that it follows that I share the same worldview with everyone who says racism is, racism is bad. Right. The idea that racism is bad or structural racism exists is what I'll call a, a something that is accessible via common grace. Mm -hmm. People who can read and analyze the world with a variety of convictions can come to that conclusion. Um, but I can come from that conclusion um, from the space of my Christian convictions and fighting for that space um, is, is one of the kind of defining characteristics of my life is the, is fighting for the space to be my black Christian self and not be pushed into one of the boxes. Now, one of the, when I talked about it in the other place in the book was this idea that when you move through, um, certain white spaces, you become black people consolidated. Right. In other in other words, um, people and this happens a lot when I talk about issues of race and injustice, mm -hmm. people will go out and they will kind of read some books. Maybe you can tell what kind of media they consume by the questions they ask. Yeah. They'll go and consume media that talks about all of these things that black people believe. And the moment I began to talk about race, they go, what about this? What about this? What about this? Mm -hmm. I was like, where did you get all of these ideas from? Oh, I heard it on on talk radio. And this is what I told the black people who believe in racism believe. And so now you as I have to then defeat all of those arguments. Like, well, I didn't assert all of those things. Right. So it's not my job to explain to you all of the things that you're upset about vis-a-vis -vis critical race theory and what mm -hmm. all of that. That ain't me. That's your that's your construct of a black person. Mm -hmm. And so trying to have the freedom to be an individual um person of faith in a context where you consistently stereotyped is an interesting one. Can I say one more nerdy thing? Yeah, we this is we love nerdy things here. So <laughs> one of the things that like I really I, I think this this may sound like crazy. I think that biblical studies, if people really paid attention to biblical studies, a lot of the arguments around race and racism would go away, at least the form of the arguments. And let me give you a perfect example. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Here's like one key one. You're gonna love this. We were in seminary, me and you, right? We're hanging around at Gordon and Conway. They teach us how to write exegesis papers, right? Mm -hmm. And they say whenever you do an exegesis paper, one of the things you have to do is word studies. Remember word studies? Mm -hmm. Word studies? Oh yeah. Because you then the the purpose of a word study is so I'm gonna be nerdy for a second to prevent something like illegitimate totality transfer, mm -hmm. which means that when someone uses the word faith. It doesn't mean every possible meaning of faith. It means the meaning of faith intended by the writer in context. And so what you do is when you see a word, you study it to gain the range of meaning and then find out how it's used by individual authors. And so you will find out that Christians in the New Testament will use words with slightly different nuances of meaning. Mm -hmm. So you can't just assume that when James says one thing in one just faith and Paul, they mean the exact same thing, right? So I just learned as a Bible scholar to understand the author's meaning of a word and sentence in context, mm -hmm. right? That's just biblical studies one-on-one. So then I, Esau Macaulay meanders out into the world, right? And you say something like justice or racism or struck systematic injustice, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that word means what I say it means based on context, right? In other words, there's a range of meaning and my meaning is, the, is defined by my usage. What you're not allowed to do is actually go find someone else who used the word, right? Bring their definition in and plump it into my sentence. Exactly. And the amount of times that you see people go and say, oh, here's the word. It comes from critical race theory. Here's the Franklin School. Here's the whole range of meaning. Like, no, in biblical studies, one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. you learn language doesn't work that way. And to understand an author, you actually have to understand the author. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it had actually been my work as a Bible scholar that has shown me that a lot of the ways that he would talk about race and injustice in language, in popular culture, is linguistically unsophisticated. Mm. And so I've just struggled to consistently say, I mean what I say in context. Right. And obviously I'm not like a perfect writer and I, and, I, and I say things that are incorrect. But what I don't allow is people to import meanings from elsewhere into my own writing and thought. Because I know in whom I believe and I know in whom is my confidence. And I know what to think about the scriptures. That's, that's, but that's how our society has devolved in yeah. public discourse is yes. if you are, everything is right, left dichotomy. So if yes. you agree with this, 
you must be on that side. And if you agree yes. with this, you must be on that side. And what I like about your writing in particular, and there, there are a few, like I said, there are a few voices out there that do this. I think you do this very well is, and I just wrote this the other day when I was finished reading how far to the promised land, what I like about Esau Macaulay, the public intellectual, and that's what you are, oh. <laughs> is that you are responsive without being reactionary. In other mm -hmm. words, you don't not respond and you don't not talk about issues that are important and maybe even issues that are divisive, but you don't do it as so many talking heads in public discourse do in a reactionary way. It's in yeah. a responsive way. And I thought that I thought reading while black is a, a book link of, uh, example of that, of, of responsively uh, taking on just the uh, so many of the ideas that have been floating around our culture these past couple of years and saying, actually, let's look at this thoughtfully with historical one, nuance. One of, the, one of the glorious things about being a writer is that you don't see the first draft. So I think that people, people, and I think that people have, like, you know me, like, you know me well enough to know, like, hey, I'm actually kind of an emotional guy. I feel things and I get excited. But what, I, what I've learned is sometimes getting that tweet off immediately isn't the most helpful for building up the body of Christ. And so there's things that I text that I don't tweet. Mm -hmm. And there's things that I say to God in prayer that doesn't become public. And sometimes there's drafts of articles. I have to write the whole angry draft that nobody sees mm -hmm. and then write the draft that I think is, is useful um, for the people of God. And I think that, I think that is I was talking to someone the other day about this, a friend of mine named Justin Gibney, um, who runs the Ann campaign. I was like, Justin, man, people think of me as this like really measured dude, but I'm not. And I just want to go off sometimes. He's like, well, maybe this is God. Um, using people's perception of you to make you a more holy person. <laughs> and what I mean by that is I, I, I do think that um, one of the one of the things that I, I, I have seen, and maybe I'm just wrong about this, is like paths to success and notoriety. Mm -hmm. And it feels like if you take an extreme position on one side or the other, that you can get a lot of people to hate you. And if, if enough people hate you, then you can build a community by resisting that hatred. Look, yeah. these are the mean people. You should like me because the mean people don't like me. Or if um, you're on the liberal side, say, look at the fundies, they don't like me. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just sitting in the middle. That's not what I'm talking about. Like the middle is not the, it's not the low high of righteousness. What I'm saying is it's sometimes avoiding polemics mm -hmm. is... Um, not always the way to garner attention, quick and easy attention. But I hope, I feel like there are people who exist in the world who recognize that sometimes things are more complicated than they might see in, at, at first appearance. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to speak to that audience, even if it's not as big as the polarizing size on, on, on one side or the other. Well, thoughtful takes last much longer than hot takes. And, yeah. and that's what I think you do well is give a thoughtful take. That mean, you're not, like you said, you're not going to be like every issue I'm going to be right in the middle of. No, some issues you're going to be like this side uh, has it right. Yeah. And some issues this side has it right. And so, yeah. but, but they're individual issues looked yeah. at as issues, not collectively as this yeah. is the, this is the script that I'm supposed to take yeah. because I hold I, to this I issue. My, I tell my students, they're not old enough to remember this, but back in the day, you used to go to the McDonald's, the Burger King, and you had to like get the order that they said. It's like burger, fry, drink. That's it. You can't That's get right. a milkshake and apple pie and large this and medium that. <laughs> it was like, no, you got it's ketchup and that's what you're gonna get, right? <laughs> or you'd kind of go to the cafeteria. These are the three things you can get from the cafeteria. This is on your lunch plate, right? And I think that sometimes we think about that when it comes to like politics. Oh, somebody else prepares the plate and that guy eat everything on the plate. Well, no, no, only want this piece on the plate. Right. The other stuff doesn't come from the plate. Mm -hmm. And so um, what I always say to my students, they have that freedom to create their own menus mm -hmm. um, and not to take on. Because like either, you know, these people have fully articulated the kingdom of God or they fall in short in some way. And that's the same thing as me too. I say the same thing. Like you definitely shouldn't take everything that I say. Like I'm either a theological genius and I finally figured out the Bible and everybody's going to say, Esau, after 2000 years of church history, Esau got it right. Or my exegesis is wrong somewhere. 
Yeah. Or my or my connecting a passage is wrong somewhere. And what we're trying to do as Christians is together discern the mind of Christ. And so I'm not engaging in the class to convince you of all my ideological opinions. Mm-hmm. My job is to, to take us on a mutual journey to understand. And of course, I think I'm right, but I have to be open to the possibility of being wrong. Like you might make me a Methodist before this is all over. <laughs> Listen, I, I don't even. I'm not reformed, so you don't got that part of travel. That's that's true. That's true. But man, Methodism is in no shape to make anybody anything until we get our house <laughs> in order right now. Um, but speaking of you are ordained in the Anglican sure. communion. Is that correct? What are, what is your fish? Cause you're doing work with outside of your denomination right now too. Right? Yes, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a theologian in residence at progressive Baptist church in, in Chicago, but I am an Anglican clergy person. Mm-hmm. Does that, and, and I assume that's through like, uh, I don't know, co- collaboration between the two. A bishop gave me permission to go hang out with the Baptist. Yes, okay. he did. <laughs> yeah. Because that was what was most people would not expect you know, like young black former football playing scholar athlete, uh, grew up and writes about the black church, has all these experiences, is an Anglican clergy person. They yeah. Go- and I remember back in seminary when you were uh, like yeah. going into Anglicanism, I was like, all right, that's interesting. Like, yeah. I, I found that I always found that it, interesting. It, it, it re- there, there's a couple of things. It really depends on on your perception of kind of global Christianity. Mm hmm. And I would say that, you know, in, for example, in Africa, um, obviously Catholicism is strong, Pentecostalism is strong, and and a lot of the African churches are, African Anglican churches are Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. Um, but the majority of global Anglicanism is black, are black, and, black and brown people. Mm-hmm. So it's not odd globally. It's, it's right. a little bit odd in the United States for a variety of reasons. The American South in particular. Um, yeah, and which, you know, that would be an, another podcast for another day to explore all of those reasons. <laughs> But I would yeah. say there is nothing inherent, inherently um, not black about liking liturgy and sacraments. One of the things that was really interesting when I went back, I was back in my hometown um, a few weeks ago, like last month in September, to look to go back to the church that I attended. And I forgot all of the elements of the service that were kind of deeply liturgical, even though I didn't know it. Mm-hmm. So we'd have kind of like an opening hymn that was always traditional. We had this thing called responsive reading mm-hmm. where the pastor would say something and the congregation would respond back to it. Um, and there was like certain, like we always sang certain songs at certain times. And so I do think that there is kind of a liturgical piety that exists in certain elements of the black Christian tradition mm-hmm. that is sometimes understated. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't see an essential, con- an essential conflict between um uh, like black culture and liturgy. Liturgy is is is, is the skeleton, right? Mm-hmm. The enculturation, the flesh that you put on it, comes from different different places. And if you go to the Caribbean, you see Anglicans with steel drums, but also have incense. Mm-hmm. And so I think that it's sometimes our limited imagination in the United States to kind of not really see the possibility of marrying a a deep liturgical sensibility with a love for black culture. So I don't see an essential conflict between the two. It's the stereotypes that we face in our cultures are, well, if you're into liturgy, you can't be into anything contemporary and vice versa. Yeah, Yeah, maybe, maybe I am stubborn enough to feel like, well, like, Part of part of our jobs um, as scholars and as people of faith and as clergy, that's all of those things describe me, is that we have to follow the evidence where our convictions take us, even if it doesn't land us in some place that is super comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so um, I believe that like the liturgical life with the with the sacraments and the church year um, and the creeds and the confessions are good for our soul. It's not the only way of being a Christian. I'm in a Baptist church that doesn't do any of those things. Right. Um, but um, the gospel is rightly preached in the ba- in the black church that I attend, and the people are being formed as disciples. And so I guess I'm a bit of an ecumenical Christian in that sense that I have my convictions, but I believe that that the Holy Spirit is evident and at work in the lives of a variety of spaces, mm-hmm. and each one of them has their own beauty. Mm-hmm. I amen. I think it's awesome, uh, folks. Follow and read Esau's stuff. 
for things like this, for challenging <laughs> stereotypes, and but yeah. not in a reactionary or in a in a um, click grabbing way, but in a deep and a profound way. And and you've you've been like this at least since I've known you for twenty something years mm -hmm. now. Uh, I, I before we end because we don't have a lot of time. I got, I got like fifteen more minutes. Okay, all right. I'm I'm okay, trying to be very. We're making it work. We'll, we'll keep going. <laughs> I've been talking to you that much. It's been twenty years. I <laughs> know, I know. I definitely got to have you back on because there's there's a lot more that I want to talk to you about. Um, but w one, have you seen the documentary on ESPN, The Cave of Adullam? No. So uh, Lawrence so Fishburne. Lame. I don't watch TV anymore, man. I don't. I don't see anything. Okay, well, so Lawrence Fishburne produced it, and my friend Jason Wilson runs it. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's called the Cave of Adullam, where David trained his mighty men. But it's a center in inner city Detroit where uh, Jason uses martial arts to mentor primarily young black boys in urban Detroit, and and to help them process trauma in healthy ways. He's wrote a couple of books, Cry Like a Man. Uh, oh, yeah. His first one. Uh, he's got big white bushy beard, bald head. He's done YouTube videos. About. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd love to connect you guys sometime. He's he's awesome. But he, he deals with that, the issue of trauma and how trauma unresolved manifests in all these ways. And the documentary follows like five of the boys throughout school and, and how, you know, he's working with it's amazing documentary. You can see it online. But he, in, in, when you're writing about your experiences growing up, there were a few points as page 16, page 24, page 40, you talked about trauma. And and I want these are beautiful lines, the way you said it, because there's incredibly profound, you said, talking about yourself, and as growing up, you said, I like so many other children bring my trauma with me to class. Yeah. And then the point on page 24, you said black children grow up fast, because our flesh stirs up complex emotions in those much older than us. That's a whole thing we could unpack for hours. During the same years when we're memorizing vocabulary words and multiplication tables, we're also readying ourselves to read and respond to grown up feelings. And then page 40, to avoid processing our traumas, we made jokes about the violence, knowing in our hearts that there was nothing particularly funny about it. One thing yeah. about black men and our suffering, we've been trained to lie to each other. The other rule of black male friendship, always accept the lie. And so what you what you're talking about in these yeah. sections and folks read the book for him like to to see the stories that these are uh, thoughts are being packed around but the idea of men in particular boys growing up yeah. not being able to process individual trauma and then yeah. collectively uh collective generational trauma there's this uh, unspoken rule within black culture. And, and you talk about it in some elements of hip hop culture and some other things. There's, there's just, there are ways it's, it's all coping with generational trauma. I, I, I think that um, it's really interesting. Um, I feel like God has been very merciful to me to, um, for my last two like full length books, how far to the promised land and reading my black they've ended up being i think important books for the moment but they were when they were released mm -hmm. and i feel like when um reading my black came out we were really asking this question as a society of is it okay to care about these things from a place of deep christian conviction right and i didn't realize that at the time this is just providence and as how parts of the promised land i was working on it i didn't realize how much issues of trauma were going to be in the public square when the book was released. Mm. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of, if the questions were exegetical four years ago, they're existential now. Right. And we're asking the question is, can God be good in the midst of a hard story? Mm -hmm. And what, in, in other words, like, not like, what does the Bible say, but like, how do these things actually take flesh in the lives of people? And so even though this book isn't, biblical in the sense of a bunch of Bible verses that quote very little scripture in the entire book. It is wrestling with this question of where is God in the midst of all of these difficult things that are happening to me? Mm -hmm. And me being honest about some of those traumas hopefully gives other people the, the, um, the comfort to be honest about their stuff too. One of the things that I'll also say, and, and I love the Academy and I don't, I don't want to like yell at my brothers and sisters in the Academy, but sometimes our trauma and our life stories are hiding behind our exegesis. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And we're pretending like we're interpreting the Bible. We're actually working out all of our stuff in class. And, um, and, like, and so like our disdain for certain things come from places that precede our opening up the Greek and the Hebrew. Mm-hmm. And so for me to, to open up and say, you know what, this is the context out of which, you know, the conviction of reading while black comes, here it is. Mm-hmm. Here's the difficult things. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of honesty um, may be helpful to people. And I, but, but, but the truth is, I just like, I'm not really good at like, maybe I'll just always be stuck where I am as far as like making it forward in life. I'm just not good at politics. <laughs> and I'm not good at pretending. And so I'm just like, man, if you believe this stuff, just say you believe it. Or if you don't, just say you don't. Or well, this is the context out of which you come to lead to these convictions. Tell the truth, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm hoping that acknowledging that that pain, and I'll say one more thing about that. Mm-hmm. One of the hardest things to kind of navigate as an African American Christian who's living in these kind of sometimes majority white spaces is that we come to God over and through the traumas that are inflicted upon us in part because of our race. Mm -hmm. In other words, our question of theodicy isn't abstract. Like, how do I make sense of the goodness of God when there's evil in the world? It's how do I make sense of the goodness of God when there are people who claim to believe in the same God who are being evil to me? Mm -hmm. And so I can't separate my Christian testimony from the fact that Jesus helps me overcome like anti-Black racism and those kinds Mm -hmm. of things. And so when I talk about Jesus helping me overcome those things and people deny the reality of those things, we're actually limiting my testimony. Right. And I have to be able to talk about all the things that happens to me because that's part of what it means to say God is good. Imagine someone who had cancer and God helped them through cancer. And that was part of their testimony. Because they said, Don't talk about cancer. That's too depressing and that's too divisive. No, no, no. Right, right. The cancer is forever a part of my testimony. Mm-hmm. Right. And so for me, the things that I experienced as a child and the fact that I'm a Christian as an adult can't be removed from my story or it's not my story. It's like and I'm I'm not Jesus. Right. So this is an analogy because I only know Bible stories. Right. (laughs) When Jesus shows us his wounds. Right. It's saying the person who was wounded is the person who is resurrected. It's It's not a different Jesus. Right. Yes. And so when we say, here are the things we went through, but God carried us through, we have to show the scars. Mm. We have to. Did or we're ha- not telling the fullness of our story. Yeah. Did you have, um, did you take uh, Revelation with Sean McDonough back at Google? I didn't. I'm a bad Christian. Uh, but I, I, I took everything else with him but Revelation. Okay, okay, good. I had him on it recently. <laughs> we were talking about that class. But one of the most profound points he made in that class that stuck with me forever was that it, through, throughout eternity, he's the slaughtered lamb. Like the the bearing the marks of his slaughter, it's part of exactly what you're saying. And that's what makes the salvation so glorious is that it's through the the horrendous suffering, not around it or downplaying it or saying that it nah, wasn't really that bad. And that's the re- and people ask me, people ask me like, why would you write um, a memoir after like writing a biblical studies book? And it's precisely this question this is the question right Mm -hmm. into what kind of context is young black man in the south find god right Mm -hmm. is it and and so what i I mean by that is yes there's racism that's in the south yes that's family trauma that's part of my background yes there's poverty that's part of my background and it's into those into that context that god enters god I, I, i i i'm thinking so much about like surprised by joy um, C.S. Lewis's conversion story. Mm-hmm. But you know what? I, I got a lot from that conversion story, but I was not meandering around Oxford with some of the greatest intellectual luminaries of, and, and, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. convincing me to become a Christian, right? No, I was a black kid in Alabama mm-hmm. dealing with cops pulling me over. Mm-hmm. And in the same way that Lewis is asking about where God is in Oxford, I'm asking where God is in Huntsville, Alabama. And for kids who have to find God in that context, yes. They need those kinds of stories. They and at, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead, go ahead. That, that's that's what I, in other words, I think that um, spiritual biographies, if they're going to be true, have to articulate what it means to come to faith from a particular space. And for me, it meant talking about 
family and racism and poverty and injustice and God and you know, liberal universities and conservative evangelical, all of that stuff mm-hmm. was a part of my own background. Yes, they have to hear those stories and and they have to see those stories embodied. And that's that's why I wanted to have you on the show more than just us to hang out because I love your work in general. But to, because it's, I think it's important. I My friend Jason, who I mentioned at the cave, after I read How Far the Promised Land, which viewers, I read his book literally in 24 hours. Uh, it was very compelling and I just, I read it almost straight through. But I texted Jason. I said, hey man, this is, you need to read this book. This is like his book, Cry Like a Man, which was his memoir about, but in urban Detroit. Because that I want people to see like people, the, the, the ability of God to reach people in their situations, wherever they are, like your situation is yours and it's real and it's, and it's, and, and there are, I think, I know that there are other people out there that are like, well, you know, I can't relate to, like you said, I can't relate to C.S. Lewis, or I can't relate to pick any other evangelical or, or even like, Christian luminary, whatever, but they can relate to, in your case, a young kid growing up in Alabama, playing football, Mm. experiencing all this stuff with his family. I folks, this is a story of Esau's family, like in a micro level, but it's, it it resonates with people all across the spectrum and, and people outside of just, you know, rural poverty, other Alabama in the late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, And so that's what I, I want readers to read the book because they're getting a glimpse into something that's bigger than just your family because of the way you're looking at your family struggle through a bigger lens. And mm-hmm. you called the book. I want to make sure people ask, why is it called How Far Are the Promised Land? And you said <clears throat> that when you looked at the history of black people in America, that God miraculously has provided it. But you said, you say, by a miracle, I do not mean a simple rescue, an escape from danger. Instead, like the ancient Israelites finding their way in the desert, we have received just enough manna in the wilderness to make it another day. That's what I love about the book is that there's nothing in it that's, it, it does come full circle in the sense that you have a beautiful resolution at the end when you're talking about you and your father and, and that relationship is just incredibly touching. But there's nothing trite about this. It's not a Hallmark movie. No. It's not, you know, it's like, this is the reality. This is the messy muddled reality, but through it all from beginning to end, you're showing and giving voice to God being faithful for you, for your family and for community in general. You know, it's funny because, um, I wish like, I was talking to my wife about this the other day. There's like my spiritual experience has always been there's an easy way or a hard way. God always chooses to take, seems to take me through the hard way. <laughs> that nothing ever comes easy. I'm blessed in a variety of ways, but that's just my reality. But one of the things that's really interesting is that even though it, the title is How Far to the Promised Land, the passage that that is underlying that entire idea is not an Exodus passage. Everyone will sit under their own vine and fig tree. There'll be no one to make them afraid, says the Lord Almighty. And for them, there was there was this idea that one day God was going to come back and rescue Israel. And when he rescued Israel, there would be no more suffering. No, they're going to they wouldn't have to be afraid of some invading army coming in to kind of blow things up. Mm-hmm. And they were all sitting under their own vine and fig tree. So the idea of the promised land was this place where people could be safe and secure with the people that they love. And when I talk about how far to the promised land, what I'm talking about is getting to that place. Well, there's no one to make them afraid, and and everyone has their own place. Mm-hmm. And for generations in my family, we've been striving to come to that place, that place where there was no one to make us afraid, and there was no one to harm us. And that journey, um, that that constant thriving is beautiful in its own right, even if we don't make it there. We don't make it to that place of safety. You know, when I initially, I know I got to go, I, when I initially wrote the book, I had a different ending in mind. Um, I planned on ending it, um, and the reader will have to see how it actually ends, but I planned on ending it by saying there is no promised land. We're looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Um, but I realized that there is a kind of home away from home that is possible for the people of God. And that even though we can't have it in, in the fullness here, that part of my work is to, is to make 
space for more African American people, more stepped on people more broadly to have a little space to call their own, their own vine and fig tree, even if only for a moment. There's this part, so I'm going full Bible, but there's this part in, in David's life. I think it's the David or Solomon. So where they, they were all on their own vine and fig tree. They're all settled in the land. Now things go bad, right? But there are these moments where like, oh, it's good for a second. And then it kind of dissipates. And so that good for a second is fleeting because we're looking for a city. But I think that it's possible for us to have those real moments of joy and community. And I want more people to experience it. Yeah. At, at, on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, that's what there we're we able to, to pray for. So. Man, I again, I had like I could ask you five hours more worth of questions, but you got to run, get your kids. And, I got to go. I got to go be a decent dad. Thank go you. Be a decent dad. <laughs> Thank you. Am I like what's after white belt? What what comes after white belt? Well, in jujitsu, it's blue. So you okay. would be a I'm disciple. Belt, belt. I now? I like your blue. second appearance. You'll be a blue belt the next time okay. you come back. I got to so. I got to leave with the white belt I came with. <laughs> if I come back, I get the blue belt. You, you, you earn it the next time. How, Man, many belts I, are there? How many times are going to come to get the black belt? How many belts are there? Well, in jujitsu is only five. So it's not a lot. Uh, so <laughs> each belt means more. Uh, okay, then. But yeah. I, if I, when I come back, I just want you to have a blue belt on the screen and show it to me. And, embroider your name on it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give it to you at SBL this year. Oh, uh, man, I really is. I so appreciate you. I The best way for anybody to connect with you uh, or to, to follow you or you give, what's your what, what's the best way for people to engage with your work? Obviously, Bullshit. other than going and ordering How Far to the Promised Land uh, and yeah, Reading Well Back. I have like Esau Macaulay is on all the, it's the same one on all the socials. Shockingly, there's not a bunch of Esau Macaulay. So I didn't have to like Esau Macaulay 42 or whatever. <laughs> yes, you're fortunate because I don't yeah. have that issue with James yeah, Michael yeah. Smith. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Well, I'll put the info up there. I'll put places uh, where people can order the book and, and follow you on your website and everything else. Um, I really do. I, I, in all sincerity, I want you to know, like, I have enjoyed seeing your ministry over the years and seeing, like, I know that guy, we were together in seminary and God's doing really cool stuff with him. And mm -hmm. I just want Disciple Dojo to magnify it however we can. So okay. thank you so well, much for coming on. Thank you. Brother. Thank you for the kind words. I really appreciate them. And I want my blue belt when I come back. It doesn't have to be important. Just show it to me so I can know that I'm earning something. All right. Well, that's you got to come back to get it. And we'll, we'll work All right. that out. I'll come back. When I come back from, I'm going to England, as you know, um, for six months um, for my sabbatical. When I come back, I'll have some more, some more content for you. And then I'll get my blue belt there. All right. I, I love that plan. <laughs> All right, brother. Take care. Talk to you later. <laughs> Bye. I hope you guys enjoyed that interview. It was so great to sit down and catch up with Esau for a little bit. Again, if you haven't read his book, How Far to the Promised Land, I'm going to pull a link where you can order it in the description below and pick up Reading While Black as well if you haven't read that. Both of these books are fantastic and both are 100% endorsed by Disciple Dojo. That's all for now. Take care. And as always, keep training.